heavenly bridegroom first shows up in force at Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus. He's just rescued the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, led them through the waters of the Red Sea, and fed them with manna from heaven. And now God wants to make a covenant with his people, the Old Covenant, the definitive Old Testament covenant. He wants to make them his family. So how does he do this? He first tells the people to prepare themselves. Consecrate yourselves, he says. How? He tells the people to wash themselves and their garments and to abstain from sexual relations. Why? This divine covenant takes the form of a wedding. If you're the bride, you wash yourself. You wear your finest clothes, and they, they better be clean. And before the wedding, one hopes, you abstain from sexual relations. There's a bit more to it than that, though. Consider how the church expects us to fast for one hour before receiving the Eucharist, so that by consciously abstaining from earthly food, we might make our bodies and ourselves more available to receive heavenly food. In the same way, the Israelites were asked to abstain from earthly relations to make themselves more ready to receive marriage with God. Then, after three days, God came down visibly upon the mountain in the sight of all the people, in thunder and lightning, in thick cloud, and loud trumpet blasts. God spoke to them the Ten Commandments, the terms of the covenant, the wedding vows, and they replied, all the words which the Lord has spoken we will do. And then Moses sealed the covenant in blood, making God and Israel literally one flesh and blood. He sacrificed oxen and threw half the blood on the altar and the other half on the people. Now, God and Israel are blood relations, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. After that, God invited Moses and 70 elders representing the people to all climb up the mountain. They saw God in some way or form. It said with the sapphire heavens unfolding under his feet, and up there on the mountain with God, they ate and drank. It's the most unusual wedding reception ever. It's a wedding feast, a strange one, and it's also intended to be a foretaste of that definitive wedding feast of heaven. So there we have the wedding at Mount Sinai. Later in the Bible, the Old Testament prophets, speaking in the voice of God, look back on this part of Israel's history as a passionate love relationship culminating in marriage. It's a classic Cinderella story. Israel is the slave girl mistreated and despised by all the world. God is Prince Charming. He swoops down, calls her his bride and his princess, saves her from misery through all kinds of supernatural interventions, and they ride off together into the promised land where they're supposed to live happily ever after. That's the form of the story. It's a Cinderella story. Uh, I've got a quote from Jeremiah here. Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. But the major place where we find God talking about how he, he found Israel the forsaken, Israel the slave, and rescued her is in a very little read part of the Bible in the 16th chapter of the book of Ezekiel. Now, this has got the, the lengthiest description in the Bible of God rescuing Israel and taking Israel as his spouse. But it's an awfully negative picture because Ezekiel is, what's the word I'm looking for? He, he's calling the people to repentance. He's haranguing them for turning to idols. And so as you'll see, this is a pretty stark and frightening picture. Ezekiel is not afraid of graphic language. Thus the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations. Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, by origin and birth, you are of the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. As for your birth, the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut. You were neither washed with water nor anointed, nor were you rubbed with salt, nor swathed in swaddling clothes. 
No one looked on you with pity or compassion to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out on the ground as something loathsome the day you were born. Then I passed by and saw you weltering in your blood. I said to you, live in your blood and grow like a plant in the field. You grew and developed. You came to the age of puberty, your breasts were formed, your hair had grown, but you were still stark naked. Again, I passed by you and saw that you are now old enough for love. So I spread the corner of my cloak over you to cover your nakedness. I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you. You became mine, says the Lord God. Then I bathed you with water, washed away your blood and anointed you with oil. I clothed you with an embroidered gown, put sandals of fine leather on your feet. I gave you a fine linen sash and silk robes to wear. I adorned you with jewelry. I put bracelets on your arms, a necklace around your neck, a ring in your nose, pendants in your ears, and a glorious diadem upon your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver. Your garments were of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. Fine flour, honey, and oil were your food. You were exceedingly beautiful with the dignity of a queen. You were renowned among the nations for your beauty, perfect as it was, because of my splendor which I had bestowed on you says the Lord God. We'll stop there. We'll continue in a little bit. So now, what happens after the marriage? What happens after God makes the covenant with Israel on Mount Sinai? What happens to spoil it all? Idol worship, the golden calf. Right after this covenant ceremony, God calls Moses up Mount Sinai to receive instructions for building the tabernacle, the place of worship. Uh, later on in our book, Jesus the Bridegroom, Brant Petrie talks about how the Jewish huppa, the tent held over the married couple during the wedding ceremony, can you picture that? It's supposed to be an image of two things, the bridal chamber and the tabernacle. The two are related to each other in Jewish tradition and in the Old Testament. The tabernacle then is where the marriage between God and Israel is to be consummated in acts of worship and adoration. So God is commissioning Moses to build the tabernacle. But something happens along the way. I'm gonna read it straight out of Exodus. When the people became aware of Moses' delay in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said to him, "Come." Make us a God who will be our leader. As for the man Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has happened to him. Aaron replied, have your wives and sons and daughters take off the golden earrings they're wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron who accepted their offering and fashioning this gold of the graving tool made a molten calf. Then they cried out, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. On seeing this, Aaron built an altar before the calf and proclaimed, tomorrow is a feast of the Lord. Early the next day, the people offered holocausts and brought peace offerings. Then they sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. One thing that strikes me is that in the passage in Ezekiel, God talks a lot about how he clothed Israel, how he gave them jewelry and gold and in this original Exodus passage, you see how they took off all the jewelry and gold that God had given to them as spoils from Egypt, as you'll remember, and used it to make an idol, how they took God's gold to make an idol. It's very much the picture being drawn here. How, how Israel is taking her bridal ornamentation and using it to commit spiritual adultery. So, Israel immediately begins worshiping other gods, and not just this once, but over and over again, with many different gods for hundreds of years. The prophets, writing some six to 800 years later, have plenty to say about this. Got a couple of quotes. Jeremiah, can a maiden forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. Surely as a faithless wife leaves her husband, so you have been faithless to me, O house of Israel, says the Lord. And now, Ezekiel 16. 
But you were captivated by your own beauty, God says. You used your renown to make yourself a harlot, and you lavished your harlotry on every passerby whose own you became. You took some of your gowns and made for yourselves gaudy high places where you played the harlot. You took the splendid gold and silver ornaments that I had given you and made for yourself male images with which you also you played the harlot. You took your embroidered gowns to cover them, my oil and my incense you set before them, the food that I had given you, the fine flour, the oil and the honey with which I fed you, you set before them as an appeasing odor, says the Lord God. The sons and daughters who had borne me, you took and offered as sacrifices to be devoured by them. Was it not enough that you had become a harlot? You slaughtered and immolated my children to them, making them pass through fire. And through all your abominations and harlotries, you remembered nothing of when you were a girl, stark naked and weltering in your blood. He then goes on to say, you played the harlot with the Egyptians, with the Assyrians, with Chaldea. And in your harlotry, you were different from other women. All harlots receive gifts. You didn't receive any gifts. You just gave away everything you had. That's what Ezekiel has to say about the spiritual adultery that Israel was committing. Think about this for a moment. God chooses to suffer a broken marriage. God experiences the repeated betrayal of his people. He chose to do this because he loves us. The most poignant account of Israel's spiritual adultery comes from the prophet Hosea. Does anyone remember that we mentioned Hosea, I think three or four weeks ago? Mm -hmm. He is the prophet whom God asked to marry a prostitute. And then Hosea preached from his heart, preached out of his pain, of just how much God loved Israel his bride and longed for her to return to him with her whole heart. Oh, let's find Hosea. Since she has not known that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and her abundance of silver and of gold, which they used for Baal. Therefore, I will take back my grain in its time and my wine in its season. I will snatch away my wool and my flax with which she covers her nakedness. So now I will lay bare her shame before the eyes of her lovers, and no one can deliver her out of my hand. I will bring an end to all her joy, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her solemnities. I will lay waste her vines and fig trees, of which she said, these are the hire my lovers have given to me. I will turn them into rank growth, and wild beasts shall devour them. I will punish her for the days of the Baals, for whom she burnt incense. While she decked herself out with her rings and her jewels, and in going after her lovers, forgot me, says the Lord. And God does indeed punish Israel for the repeated infidelity. After the time of these prophets, Babylon conquers Israel, and the Israelites are led away into captivity. And there in captivity, they experience spiritual renewal. When forced to make a decision between worshiping the gods of the Babylonians and worshiping God, they make the right decision. They do come back to God, and they do put away their idols. Persecution did wonders for them. And Israel's unfaithfulness then was not the end of the story. God's got more to say. First, he says that despite Israel's infidelity, he's always going to love them no matter what, and he'll never leave them. Through everything, he remains Israel's faithful husband. Isaiah writes, For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth, his is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing wrath for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting mercy I will have compassion on you, says the Lord your Redeemer, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed. God calls Israel to return to him, and he will always take her back. Ah, one last passage from Hosea, Hosea chapter 2. 
It's how God describes how he's going to call Israel back. So I will allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak to her heart. From there, I will give her the vineyards she had and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. She shall respond there as in the days of her youth, when she came up from the land of Egypt. On that day, says the Lord, she shall call me my husband, and never again my Baal. Then I will remove from her mouth the names of the Baals, so that they shall no longer be invoked. I will make a covenant for them on that day, with the beasts of the field, with the birds of the air, and with the things that crawl on the ground. Bow and sword and war I will destroy from the land, and I will let them take their rest in security. I will espouse you to me forever. I will espouse you in right and in justice, in love and in mercy. I will espouse you in fidelity, and you shall know the Lord. And after their exile in Babylon, Israel does return to the Lord and put away its idols. The prophets then foretell the new covenant, the everlasting covenant, where the marriage between God and his people will reach a whole new level. God will forgive her sins through this new covenant. And that new covenant, of course, is our covenant through the blood of Jesus Christ. There's basically three levels then in this marriage covenant. You get the old covenant with Moses, the new covenant with Jesus, and the everlasting covenant of heaven. And through this, this three-part marriage covenant, God calls us to union with him. A union that is faithful, fruitful, and everlasting.